institutionalism itself. And when it comes to the methods, uh, you'll find, uh, for example, um, Kathleen Thelen's work on soldiers and mothers, uh, which is a sort of major work of hers using that historical institutionalist approach, um, it, it it's really been cut back for the published format. So you don't really get to see the methods that have been used uh, in detail. You get to see the findings and the ideas and where they came from, but it doesn't really show you how to conduct that analysis. So what I'm attempting to do here and in the course at the end of the year is to look at uh, historical institutionalism as as a method uh, and to state that method so that it can be used or reused. Uh, and I'll give you a couple of examples where that's actually happened so far. So how do we overcome th these shortcomings? Well, first we can uh, use comparison over time. So uh, quasi experimental, I guess, uh, where we can uh, match up uh, two different countries or two similar countries or, or whatever. Um, the, the point being, I guess, that um, we, uh, I guess I'll, I'll get to this in a minute. What, what we can do is use institutions as the independent variable, for example and the outcomes that we're looking at as the dependent variable. So we look to the institutions as the differences and see what cause and effect they have on, on a given uh, policy variable, for example. Um, what we're looking for is plausible, not implausible, but plausible as opposed to falsifiable findings. So again, it's uh, very much inductive in that we draw general principles from the cases we observe, um, but uh, again, it's, it's near and more. Well, it's impossible to conduct experiments um, using deductive um, methods uh, at the nation state level. Um, one of my sort of favorite approaches is to use Mill's method of difference. And uh, so, so John Stuart Mill and his uh, uh, scientific method um, goes through a list of different techniques. The, the method of difference is very simple in that uh, we've probably all used it. And if you're not familiar, probably the easiest way to explain it is imagine if you went to dinner and uh, a couple of people in your group um, had food poisoning, you would determine what they ate that was different from everybody else. And you would then use that as the cause. So for example, if the two people ate prawns and nobody else did, then the prawns would be uh, deemed to be off and they caused they were the cause of the food poisoning, as an example. So Mill's method of difference uh, can be quite useful in terms of a most similar and most different systems design. Um, so as an example, if you will look to look to Australia and Canada as uh, great examples of uh, similar countries uh, where we can hold most other things um, to to be similar, as in uh, culture and history and, and, and uh, political systems and so on, uh, whereas we can then look to um, the differences in whether it's the institutions or constitutions or whatever, whatever, whatever it is looking at. Uh, another interesting thing, is where you can look to the dependent variables such as a policy outcome and compare countries that are very different and see how those differences actually impact upon um, the particular outcome. Uh, I was looking into a comparison of Australia and Jordan in the Middle East uh, in terms of telecommunications uh, some time back. And it was quite interesting that the, the, the one of the major differences was the uh, lack of historical legacies uh, because Jordan had uh, very old systems when the internet came out, it basically leapfrogged uh, over some of the uh, older technologies such as ADSL uh, and was sort of going straight to mobile uh, broadband, whereas Australia was well behind at that stage. So being able to uh, conduct uh, these most different systems design uh, comparisons can lead to some interesting results and understandings as well. But uh, what I find is that this idea of process tracing enables standardization of our analytical techniques uh, as opposed to the empirical rummaging that uh, Felon uh, refers to. And uh, by using process tracing is basically having a way of uh, tracking the historical um, uh, issues and implications uh, over time that have led to a given result. Um, and if we can use a, a standard process of uh, tracing these um, processes in policy or whatever it is we're looking at, um, it, it it tends toward uh, greater rigor in, in our techniques. Um, I just make mention here, I'm sorry, this um, thing's in the way of my reading my own screen. Um, I, um, we had a chapter recently in uh, Peter Chan's uh, Australian Politics uh, Open Textbook on government business relations. And if you're interested, um, I go into some detail 
about the different levels of analysis in government business relations uh, around the micro, meso and macro. Um, what, what I've found is that this uh, process tracing model that I'll introduce today tends to work best at the meso level. So meso, of course, meaning middle. Uh, and in terms of uh, policy, uh, for me, I tend to look at industry policy and regulation. So if you look at the industry or sectoral level and compare sectors across nation states, it tends to... Um, I guess, give you a more sort of focused and more nuanced uh, understanding of these processes. Um, so what I mean by that, it, again, it depends on what you're, what you're actually looking at and what you're looking for in terms of uh, the policy analysis that you may be conducting. But as an example, if you were to compare uh, what happens at a national level, you'd have to focus very much on certain decisions around certain policy issues, whereas trying to do a macro level analysis, there are too many differences that means that you're... you're um, uh, your comparative method is not going to work. Um, so, so I, I, I guess um, just being conscious of those different levels of analysis uh, and, and around the issues that you're looking at uh, becomes very important in terms of the application of this technique that I introduce here. <coughs> Excuse me. So what I'd like to do is just uh, introduce some key definitions uh, which will help in understanding the model. Um, first, uh, institutions and institutionalism. My, my favourite definition of institutions is the formal and informal rules of the game, uh, according to March and Olson. But uh, but in, in effect, the formal mechanisms that we use to govern collective action, so laws and state organisations, but also the informal rules, routines, procedures and so on. Um, a, a really good example has just happened in the selection of the uh, Supreme Court uh, Justice in the United States. You'll see that there was a sort of convention applied against Barack Obama, which was simply overturned. So that was an example of the sort of informal approach to uh, to appointments. And of course, we have similar situations in Australian history, particularly around 1975 with um, Joe Bielke Peterson's uh, going against convention in uh, selecting the, uh, the the senator following the death of the 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 senator, which of course led to um, the the dismissal, but uh, but yeah, so so also uh, institutionalism is a, a way of viewing institutions as a major influence on policy and individual behaviour. So it's not so much that in individual behaviour may still may still be rational, but it's it's actually limited or constrained uh, by these institutions. So of course there is. Uh, sociological and rational institutionalism uh, as as other aspects of um, the new institutions. And I guess what I'm saying is not so much that um, individuals can't do things differently, but that uh, institutions tend to be uh, strong and difficult to change. Uh, and and I guess that's uh, depends on the area we're applying it to. But like I said, in terms of infrastructure policy, because we have these historical legacies that are different, difficult to change, then the ideas of institutional uh, institutionalism uh, apply uh, rather well. Uh, next is uh, critical junctures. And again, I'll explain this in the context of punctuated equilibrium uh, soon, but uh, a critical juncture is a certain point in history where uh, choices made or not made tend to influence pe the periods of stability that follow. Uh, so in, in historical institutionalism, critical junctures are often viewed as these contingent events which force the state to change the prevailing institutional arrangements. So one of the most uh, important studies of critical junctures has come about from the idea of wars. So if you have a war and a state is destroyed, look at Iraq, for example, um, following the uh, invasion of Iraq by the United States, uh, Iraqi institutions were completely overturned and were able to be rebuilt. This is not something that would happen in a, a normal sort of political or not necessarily be easy to happen in a normal uh, political situation. Um, the, the main thing, I guess, about critical junctures is that they need to be exogenous. There is some debate around this, but uh, in, in terms of applying it to the model here, um, an exogenous uh, critical juncture is basically an event outside of the institution, so something that changes the institution from the outside. Um, again, that's that issue of uh, being tautological that the institutions, if they're designed to provide stability, they can't really change themselves. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about uh, some other aspects of critical junctures uh, shortly as well. But past uh, dependency, um, basically results from the choices that are made at these critical junctures, and they tend to uh, restrict future choices in, in that they establish institutions. Um, one of, Probably one of the best examples is um, uh, in Australia, for example, um, 
the uh, Australian Constitution sets out certain responsibilities for uh, states and, uh, and and the federal government, and we've seen this in the response to COVID, where states are doing uh, you know what they what they can do constitutionally and so on, and it's very difficult uh, for these things to be changed. We've seen this idea of um, the uh, COAG uh, disappearing and the new um, national cabinet being formed, but these. Uh, th these, I guess, are more informal conventions uh, as opposed to established institutions that have that constitutional backing. So um, I, I guess what I'm getting at is that the path dependency based on the constitution restricts the uh, the choices that can be made in the present uh, without actually going to uh, referendum and so forth. So these um, um, institutions become these powerful inertial forces which make it difficult to undo or change uh, particularly once resources have been committed to a particular path, but also when behaviours have uh, uh, gathered around that. Uh, another example, of course, is if you look at the uh, electricity industry, electricity generation industry in Australia, um, because we've had such reliance on coal for so long and industry groups and lobbying and political systems are all built around these older industries, uh, it's very difficult to change even though we have uh, alternatives which uh, which can and do work. Uh, so uh, again, that's an idea of that sort of path dependency, previous decisions, sunk costs and so on. And these initial choices have available in the present. A punctuated equilibrium uh, follows the choices and institutional arrangements which occur at these critical junctures. So basically what we have are long periods of stability. Uh, a critical juncture occurs, it changes the... Um, the, the status quo, uh, we end up with either new or revised institutional arrangements, uh, and then we have another period of uh, uh, stability. Um, again, it depends on the level of analysis when you look at a macro level. Uh, one example is the Bretton Woods multilateral institutions, so the World Bank and what became the World Trade Organization and so on. Uh, these sorts of arrangements have been long standing. Uh, they're very difficult to change. Um, there has been a lot of uh, change on the outside of these institutions, but they still remain uh, extant. Uh, so, and of course, that was the result of uh, the Second World War um, en enabling these changes to be made. Um, so, so I guess um, if you look at uh, like a more sort of micro level, um, you, you can see, and, and by micro, I guess I mean the behaviour of firms sort of level uh, for, for any of you that study management. Um, at, at that level, I, I guess we have shorter time frames, uh, and the, and the the uh, length of stasis tends to be shorter. Uh, again, depending on what it is. Um, lastly, I want to mention this uh, ideas. Um, so Dave Marsh will always talk about uh, his his mate uh, Colin Hay and Colin Hay's focus on ideas as as being a form of critical juncture. Um, I, I guess. Um, this is something that we've we've seen in terms of the political economy, particularly if you look at Keynesianism giving way to uh, and protectionism giving way to um, uh, well, what some would call neoliberalism, but a more sort of uh, market based uh, new right ideas about the economy. Uh, we saw it change back again with Kevin Rudd uh, and the global financial crisis. And now, of course, we've seen it change back to this uh, uh, Trump's uh, protectionism and trade wars and so on. So ideas can be very powerful in terms of uh, either bringing about in incremental change to inst institutions, uh, but I guess it, it tries to make um, make uh, make it possible for policy learning and other forms of environmental change to bring about change to inst institutions. Again, we have this problem of it being uh, tautological that uh, institutionalism um, can explain both stasis and change. But uh, again, um, if we stick to the method rather than the theory, um, uh, hopefully this model can explain it a bit uh, a bit better. Um, this model has been published in uh, in policy studies uh, last year. Um, and I, I guess I want to attempt to explain this. <laughs> this, uh, this model is uh, a model of path dependent punctuated equilibrium. Um, Studies tend to look at path dependency or punctuated equilibrium as opposed to combining the two. But I've found that when you take an extremely long time frame, and in this particular study, it was looking at um, telecommunications technologies beginning with the telegraph up to the present. And what was interesting, uh, sorry, what was interesting was um, uh, 
when I was conducting my research in Canada, uh, everybody I spoke to there said that if you want to understand Canada's uh, broadband situation, you have to go back to the telegraph. You have to understand the legacies of the telegraph and what that created because we're still living that reality today. Uh, and, and what's interesting is that um, the Canadian uh, Constitution, the British North America Act, um, it actually came out after the telegraph had been established. So uh, by that time, the extant practice was incorporated into the Constitution, whereas it was interesting that Australia's um, um, 50, Section 51V of the Constitution uh, actually introduced a new way of managing uh, the telegraph and other like services and so on. But, uh, but the point being, um, people were using... Uh, re responding to my research, suggesting that I was completely wrong uh, and that the Telegraph had nothing to do with uh, what was happening today. What was interesting was that the industry experts actually disagreed with that view. So when, when I went back and, and I looked at uh, trying to understand that development and looking at thick description as ways of capturing what had happened over a period of time, this particular model uh, emerged. And what I found was that um, a new technology or a new invention uh, can actually become the exogenous event that creates the critical juncture. But in order for it to be a critical juncture, it needs to create some form of a policy problem uh, that leads to an assessment of the options and then some sort of a policy choice. Now, again, there, uh, we can go into definitions about policy problems, policy choices, and so on. But if you can think of just in simple terms, uh, what I mean by a new invention, um, if anyone remembers the WAP phones that came out in the early 2000s, I had one, cost about $800, and WAP never worked and it disappeared. <laughs> um, WAP did not create a policy problem. Um, it uh, WAP phones didn't create a policy problem. Uh, it didn't require policy choices and so forth. Whereas if you look at the iPhone, for example, which is a much more advanced version of um, and mobile uh, telephony more generally, uh, smartphones today, these have created uh, policy problems and we've had corresponding uh, changes to the way we do things. Uh, just to give you a really simple example, the move to multi-factor authentication at the University of Canberra uh, is, is a result of smartphones. Now, in the past, uh, can you imagine um, using your private um, communications devices for, for work purposes uh, in such a way? Uh, it's, it's kind of bizarre that there's an expectation that everyone has a mobile phone or a smartphone uh, and needs to have one in order to do to actually log on to your computer at work. I mean, these are you know major changes to the work and, and, and live, I guess. So um, a new invention has to create a policy problem. Uh, we then have an assessment of options and then a policy choice. And that policy choice uh, tends to lead to long periods of, um, of stasis over time. Uh, the NBN is a great example. Uh, the coalition couldn't simply undo the NBN because of the contracts and other things that had been established. Um, th there were also expectations uh, around uh, how they would deal with it. Um, so. Um, the thing is that if we look now, the NBN, we're stuck with this uh, this monster that's not providing what it was meant to provide, and Telstra is now providing 5G services. I don't know if any of you have used have a 5G phone in Canberra and Sydney and places like that. You can you can get like over 500 meg connections to the internet. Uh, I'm I can run my entire house off my mobile phone connection now, which is far superior to what I had as uh, NBN in Canberra and even ADSL out here in Gunning. Um, so, so these changes, um, uh, so, sorry, the, the, the status quo, however, uh, remains and it's difficult to change. And what, what you can see is that, uh, as I said, with uh, telecommunications technologies, um, they create the exogenous event. We have this period of stability, then a new invention changes. So from the telegraph to the telephone, to the radio and so on, up to broadband today and now to 5G. Uh, and, and we can see that these policy decisions that have been made in the past uh, actually restrict what we can do uh, in the future or, or in the present. And I guess it's not necessarily a, a hard choice, but it's it'd be quite difficult, for example, to scrap the NBN right now uh, with the billions of dollars that have been invested in that. But one of the other issues, I guess, is that next time we... Um, were to make decisions or policies around these sorts of technologies, I, I think what needs to happen is we need to consider the lock-in effects that these create. 
and another example in Australia um, is uh, with transport. As I said, this this model tends to work best with uh, network technologies. But around transport, we have all these. Um, it, it was actually a 1956 decision. Uh, by the Privy Council at the time, uh, which prevented the railways from having a, a state-run monopoly that enabled um, uh, the trucking industry to take over the move, moving of freight in this country. So now, of course, we've got these uh, highways, we've got this rail system, which is just designed for steam trains, no investment in it because they weren't able to recover the costs. Um, we saw trams being removed from all the major capital cities around that time as well, because the the bus uh, lobby industry uh, was was able to uh, you know change the infrastructure that was being used. Um, and, and what's really interesting is if you go back to George Street now in Sydney, um, they were actually digging up the old tram lines to put in the new tram lines once again. So it's quite bizarre how these things go around in wheels and circles. But I, I guess when you look at the um, when you use this uh, sort of um, method of process tracing, what you also look for around uh, not just the exogenous event, but how the policy problem plays out in terms of the policy actors and how the choices are made. Uh, when you look at the the interests that are involved uh, involved at that critical juncture, uh, I, I think this tends to uh, explain a, a good deal of that lock-in that can occur. Uh, and, and like I said, it's a really interesting uh, story in transport in this country that uh, different decisions in different industry lobby groups have uh, actually left us with legacies that we're still living out over uh, up to 70 years later. Um, there's a couple of other points around this model. Um, what I've found also is you need to have some sort of an underlying, underlying theoretical understanding of what you're dealing with. Uh, if you notice on the bottom of this model, uh, it, it mentions technological momentum over time. Uh, just to sort of put it simply, um, two approaches to understanding technology is uh, either um, social constructivism, which is basically we construct the technologies we need, we're in charge of um, technology or technological determinism, which basically means that technology determines uh, what we do and how we act. Uh, technolo technological momentum is a sort of a middle uh, way of understanding uh, both of these. And, and again, I, I think it depends on the type of study you're doing, but, um, but it is useful to have some sort of a theoretical understanding of uh, what, whatever it is that you're, you're studying um, in, in uh, how you apply it to the model. So some uses to date include um, comparison of communications technologies in Australia and Canada. Um, Stephen Darlington, uh, you may be familiar with Stephen, he's worked with us uh, for many years in uh, in the school as a session um, and, uh, and for some of our overseas classes. Um, Stephen's a new uh, PhD thesis, uh, which is, uh, he's about to graduate shortly. He used uh, a similar model in comparing e-health policies in Australia, the UK uh, and the United States. Uh, I have a chapter coming out in uh, John Warner's Fest Rift book that we've we've now got off to the um, the, the publishers, uh, and it's looking at models, government business relations, uh, drawing on some of these ideas. Uh, and I'm currently working on uh, the impact of ideas on multilateral institutions uh, based on the work I've done in a book chapter that came out earlier this year. Uh, and now I'm, I'm looking at uh, in some more detail on a road pricing comparison uh, using sort of similar techniques. Um, these are some of the references that I've referred to here. Uh, and here's the detail of the uh, Asprey conference, uh, if, if, if uh, anyone's interested. But I, I guess um, what I'm sort of trying to demonstrate here is that the uh, historical institutionalism um, may not be useful necessarily as a theory or explaining uh, institutional stasis and change. But I think some of the uh, ideas and the techniques of historical institutionalism can be quite powerful when used in uh, comparative political science studies that give us that rigor that I guess enables findings to emerge as opposed to that indu inductive approach of finding evidence that suits the outcome we're trying to explain or, or, or the answer that we're looking for. So uh, thank you very much. I hope that's uh, been useful and I look forward to any feedback. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, we might open this up for questions, but while others are bringing their thoughts together, um, I'd just like to throw values into the mix, which won't be a surprise to anyone. Um, when I, um, and I'll put my video on so that you can see me. Um, 
when I did some work around the transformation of the Australian Wheat Board, which I published a few years ago, what I was interested in was the way institutions actually embody the values that um, that dominated debate at the time of their establishment, and then they become very difficult to shift. So part of the stickiness of institutions is that they actually embody particular particular values choices. So I'll use the Wheat Board example. Australian Wheat Board was established in 1948, and it was the result of a tussle within the wheat industry between values of collectivism and farmers all supporting each other and pooling their, their crop to, to benefit everyone and the much more market-based approach to marketing wheat. And these values played themselves out through quite bitter debates in the wheat industry in the 1930s. When the Australian Wheat Board was established, it was established based on those collective values. And those values then drove a lot of the decision-making that was made around the Wheat Board. The Wheat Board's collapse was ultimately a result of some conflicting values that came into the institution. So I think in addition to ideas, Michael, it's worth thinking about where values fit um, in the in the establishment of institutions. So if you think in Australia about some of, there's been some studies done in the historical institutional literature about layering of pensions and superannuation in Australia. So the pension system was set up on a very, on basically on values of collectivism around supporting the elderly in our community. Superannuation is a much more individualist approach to old age and caring for the elderly. So there's a really interesting, um, some of Thielen's work that she's done um, with Streak in his book about how institutions change, suggests that one way they change is through layering of different values. And they use the Australian situation as an example, that we still have the pension system, which is those collectivist values, but we've layered the values of superannuation and a more individualist approach on top. And I think values can actually be an interesting way of looking at how an institution is sustained and how it changes um, over time. So I might shut up there and um, see if Thanks, Linda. That, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's quite interesting. I, I guess, um, yeah, I, I, I guess it would depend on uh, what sort of comes out uh, around the time, I mean, it, it's it's interesting in Australia. I, I'm I'm trying to write something at the moment about the how the private sector in Australia has been stifled by government ownership of telecoms, and it's really difficult because even the scholars in this area they're protective of government ownership of uh, telecommunications. So I guess that sort of value and valuing government ownership uh, and that idea of collectivisation is something that I haven't considered. So that could be quite useful. Thanks for that. That was a very comprehensive presentation, Michael. You've given everybody a lot to think about. I'm not seeing any hands coming up. Hi. Hello, Michael. Can I can I um, provide a comment? My name is Flavia. I'm a PhD student. Hello. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, my PhD is actually on... Um, I'm trying to understand the different um, path-dependent uh, processes within uh, policy trajectory. So I'm looking at industry policy in Australia. So your presentation is very much about what I'm looking at. Um, I'm just thinking about, um, and perhaps I comment, how endogenous change and, and, and um, you know, piggybacking what Linda was talking about, how this process of layer, uh, layering conversion that may occur, how that would fit in your model. And, yep. and also, sorry, if I could come and have a chat with you later at some other day, that would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No problems catching up for a chat, uh, probably online at this stage. But um, yeah, I guess I didn't really look, I haven't really looked in detail at that endogenous change. Um, and, and I guess, like I said, part of the problem is that if you're using HI as a theory, it doesn't have a lot of answers. And I caught up with Al Stark at the PPN conference early earlier this year. And that, that uh, idea of the different levels is really important. So when you go to the macro level, um, I really liked Al's explanation. He was saying that when you use a top-down approach, like looking down on the institutions, um, it, it, you can see that sort of uh, path dependency and so on quite vividly. But if you turn it upside down and look from a micro level, it's just so messy that you, uh, I, I guess it's sort of like trying to apply a model 
um, as opposed to letting the model speak for itself, if that makes makes any sense. Um, so, I, look, what I would what I would suggest is that um, if there is clear, clearly punctuated equilibrium, if you look at the critical junctures and what was happening there, whether it's ideas or values or or whatever it may well be, um, I, I I guess probably the biggest problem with endogenous change, just to give you an example, I was doing some work with John Wanner and one of the federal departments on um, uh, stewardship. And the, the Public Service Act ha has now, it says that uh, CEOs or secretaries are responsible for the stewardship of their departments. Stewardship traditionally relates to making policy decisions that go out at least 30 years so that they're intergenerational. And of course, we've had the intergenerational reports and all these sorts of things. And what was really interesting was we did all this work. It was going to happen. And then we saw a change in uh, leadership, political leadership, which led to change in leadership of the department and all that work just disappeared. So it's still there. Um, but the critical in terms of stewardship without explanation is mentioned in the Public Service Act, but uh, nothing nothing has actually happened with it. So it was going to happen. It didn't happen. So I would say that that's not a critical juncture because the idea was raised, but it wasn't acted on. Uh, and then it was quite easily changed. Whereas I think sometime in the future, this will come back and we may well see this endogenous change. When I teach leadership, I actually use a strategic model um, which shows how leadership can bring about micro level change, so organizational change. Um, I, I just find it a little, little difficult to sort of collapse all of these big nation state level ideas down to that micro level though. So. Look, I, I, like I said, I, I guess instead of trying to force a model on your particular study, um, look at what the main points are. And if process tracing is something that's useful, then, you know, maybe look into developing a, uh, avoiding that empirical rummaging approach. That's probably the best advice I could give at this stage. But yeah, happy to talk further. Thanks. Ben has his hand up. Hi, Ben. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, no problems. How are oh, you? Excellent. Uh, yeah, well, thanks for this presentation, uh, Michael. It, it touches on a number of um, economics themes as well, right? We we uh, we also study institutions. We have a general institution economics. Um, institutions play quite an important role in economics research. Um, I was I was in, wondering whether you might uh, find a role for inertia in your model. Mm, mm. I think some institutions arise for critical, you know, through a critical juncture or something along those lines. Uh, and sometimes they're just hard to get rid of simply because of inertia, because people get used to them. And um, and even though reasons to, to remove them accumulate, uh, nothing happens. Because it's just more convenient to keep on going uh, with, with what is known, right? Then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, you see that in the public transport debate. Um, I, I actually used a, a, a story from the Onion. It's like a roast sort of uh, media in the US. I used that in a in our book on road pricing. Um, everyone wants public transport and they want investment in it, but it's for other people. <laughs> so. You know they're happy that there'll be less people on the road which means they can still drive their car and it's it's actually really true because particularly in the us and australia we have such a habit of individual transport using our cars that even when there's an alternative we still don't take it because we just don't want to and so the, there's that individual level inertia as well um yeah look i, I must admit I, I douglas north covered a lot around the same time that march and olsen wrote about uh, so his his work from 1990 looked at the impact of history uh, and it's it's quite interesting from that uh, economic history perspective and, and I guess um, well as you know government business relations tends to sort of straddle political economy as well um, what I try and do though is stay away from the quantitative side of things and stick to that economic history and and qualitative uh, approaches but but yeah I, I mean you're quite right about inertia. I guess that probably explains that idea of stewardship as well, that um, it was only under leadership that the changes might have happened. And as soon as the leadership changed, it went back to the old ways immediately. It didn't get that critical mass that it needs. But again, I, I think that's the, the trouble is that inertia 
prevents a critical juncture. I was looking more at once the critical juncture actually occurs. Uh, and, and I think that's when we actually see the institutional change, whereas inertia, I guess, explains why they take so long to change. Yeah, yeah, which which wasn't what I was really focused on. But yeah, I guess um, it, it's probably useful at that uh, multilateral level. Um, I mean, uh, one, one of the things I looked at, it's really interesting that China, I never really understood this idea of technical capacity um, in terms of administrative capacity, and China really struggles in that regard. So the World Trade Organization, the World Bank and so on, are absolutely necessary to China's development to train them in their administrative procedures. And you can imagine it's the biggest country in the world. So, you know, it takes a lot of effort. Um, but I never really understood that until I looked at multilateralism. And I guess China's interest in developing its administrative capacity through these existing institutions is another reason they're not going to disappear, despite what Trump is doing, because China actually needs them. So, yeah, I guess um, inertia has all sorts of elements. And that goes back to what Al Stark was saying, that you turn it upside down and it's so messy, it's it's difficult to understand. But, yeah, no, thanks, Ben. That's great. <clears throat> I'll, I'll also take the chance to, uh, yeah, to, to get back to you on... Uh... You know, you sent me a paper that I was going to comment on, and you know, I've been sucked into a vortex of online teaching. Uh, <laughs> yes, but I, I, I get it. On that, you know, you probably the most time. Yeah, no, no problems. Uh, look, I, I've been, I've been the same. I, I had to start um, straight after leave teaching in uh, China, which was great, but it was killer. Eight hours a day sitting in front of this, it was absolutely killed me. So it's over now, thank goodness. <laughs> Um, Michael, can I just jump in a couple of things? Um, there's a comment in the chat that I'll come to, but I also want to suggest that one of the things that's worth thinking about as well, picking up on Ben's point about inertia, is that often um, institutions have parallel and supporting institutions that have developed within the values frame. So, for example, the Australian Wheat Board, sorry to keep going back to this example, but um, it was very supported by the Grains Council of Australia because mm -hmm. the grains because it was written into the inst into the legislation that the Australian Wheat Board had to consult with industry when it was making decisions about pricing and about the operation of the wheat pool, and um, the Grains Council was named as the industry. So you then got this very symbiotic relationship built up between the Grains Council and the Wheat Board, which actually involved with the Wheat Board funding some of the activities of the Grains Council. Um, and what happened was when the wheat board collapsed after the Oil for Food program, the Grains Council very quickly followed because it was so embedded with the institutions of the old wheat board that it didn't mm. feel, it didn't fit with the, with the new one. So obviously, if you've got a lot of parallel and supporting institutions that share the value set of your main institution, they contribute to inertia because they are, in a sense, third voices that are defending the institution if it's under threat. Um, I've just flipped you, um, Michael, in case you haven't seen it, some references to some of that wheat board, work, wheat board work that I've done, which is a, brings a values perspective to HI. Um, and we've got a comment from Jenny in the chat saying it's worth also thinking about the extent that institutional narratives and the values they reflect can enable institutions to withstand technological changes that threaten their worldview. And she's used the example of um, air traffic control and air navigation policy. Yeah, no, thanks, Jenny. Yeah, I, I, uh, the wheat board and also that air traffic control. Yeah, they're both very interesting. I guess, I, I mean, I guess it depends on, on what you're studying, but uh, uh, yeah, that, I'm interested in that idea of values. Um, like I said, what's really struck me is when you talk about telecommunications, all of the telecommunications scholars in Australia, almost all, uh, actually are supportive of government ownership. And if you speak against government ownership, you don't get published. It, it's, it's this sort of crazy political side of uh, this, you know, the, the political science and not, well, not just political science, but the, the, the scholars actually supporting those uh, existing narratives as well. Um, and, and like I said, it's quite bizarre because Telstra basically said, oh, well, if you're going to run broadband, then great, we're going to invest in 5G <laughs> and make your system obsolete. I mean, but we saw that coming. We saw that coming 20 years ago. And it was just bizarre that the, um, the sort of response that was supported by scholars as well as the, the bureaucrats at the time was to go back to the old way of doing things. And once again, um, 
the private sector in Australia has um, has done a great job, but they get unacknowledged. And I, I know that I'm not suggesting that private sector is the greatest thing, and but it's kind of interesting if you look, for example, at what just happened in Victoria. Why is it that the private security guard choice was the problem? And do they really think that the ADF would have been any better at doing personal security? I mean, the ADF's not trained to do that sort of job. So I guess it's like a counterfactual, but again, it it runs along that idea of values that government control is better than anything else. And I guess that's part of our problem is I think many of our governments actually think they can control policy, that they can make things happen. And when it doesn't happen, we're shocked. And, and I just don't sort of understand why that's the case. Maybe it is those values that locks it in. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to jump in and, and comment on that because uh, I've had a similar experience recently with the Fair Work Commission. Uh, I've done a fair bit of work over the years on the work of the Commission and uh, recently I've had a spate of rejections from local journals with um, uh, domestic referees obviously being scarfing and exaggerating every claim I make. Um, and I've never had that experience before. They seem to be completely protective of the Fair Work Commission. It cannot be criticised, right? It's, it stands for fairness and justice, and, and whoever comes there to uh, uh, to, to even criticise or even suggest that, that there is, you know, there are some uh, some some marginal uh, lack of independence in the decisions being made, or uh, it's just not going to be tolerated. So we, we eventually eventually had to send our paper as far as possible from australia to get yeah to overseas yeah Australia. absolutely yeah 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 no, no i've had that experience it's uh I, I find it quite bizarre it's just not scholarly i don't understand <laughs> yeah exactly it, it was exactly my impression too it was mm. just not um not academic yeah yeah any further questions Hey Michael, I'll ask you a question. If Hi Michael, question. how are you? Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask quickly, uh, so you mentioned in your theoretical underpinnings that you were thinking of incorporating deterministic as well as constructivist approaches, and I, I don't want to get too kind of in the, in the weeds on, on debates around these issues, but in like sociological approaches to science and technology studies, um, technological determinism is seen as kind of like a problematic theoretical approach just because what arises out of or constructivism really arises out of the reaction to determinism. So I just wondered kind of how you were you know, handling that kind of debate and, and what, what you, you kind of thought in relation to that that kind of history. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I guess I guess it was that sort of trying to understand uh, technology and uh, there was uh, is it Hughes? Hughes, I think, did the work on scientific revolutions or, or electricity systems, or they were looking at the culture and how culture um, influences. Uh, I, I call it, um, I, I refer to them as policy regimes, but another way of explaining it is industry culture. I think Dyson did some work on manufacturing industry culture in Japan. I think that's right. Um, yeah, I, I guess what I was trying to do was I wanted to avoid the normative debate because I remember when I was first presenting around broadband with my thesis back in the day, someone would say, well, why is this good for us? <laughs> and my response was, I'm not interested in the normative aspects of it. This is what governments are pursuing. I'm looking at how effective they are in pursuing these particular policies. And it was the same sort of thing with uh, technology. I had to have a an understanding of technology, a theoretical understanding that didn't sort of err toward we can or we can't control technology. And technological momentum, I guess, fits well with that idea of punctuated equilibrium that um, it, it sort of shows how different technologies can be complementary and supplementary over time. Um, and, and that's where it was quite useful. So that that way, it was, it's, it's a kind of soft determinism, I guess, is uh, the way that I, I defined it, I, I think I said not hard before, but yeah, a kind of soft determinism, um, but based on the legacies as opposed to, you know, technology is so powerful, we can't control it, um, if, if that yeah. makes sense. Okay, thanks. I 
That seems like a good time to end, Linda. <laughs> I don't, yes. I don't know if you can see Michael. There's comments also. John John Paul's put put a comment in the um box at you. Oh, sorry, I didn't see it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we've got kind of having a bit of a side conversation here about um the fact that the the government took all the blame for the the wrongdoings of the contractors and the employees of the private companies, which. I think it's probably if it had been Gladys Berejiklian, the op the opposite would have occurred. Um, it's just part of the 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 media campaign against Dan Andrews, I suspect. Um, yeah, so the minister of the health had to go, but but what happened to the companies who were the ones who were supposed to be doing the work? So it's kind of a bit of a side chat there, Michael, yeah. rather than some specific questions. No, no, that's fine, but but it's interesting. The same thing happened to Peter Garrett with the um, roof insulation. Those companies should have been charged and that should have been the end of it. It, it you know, it's kind of bizarre that, um, you know, that our politicians are scapegoats for, for you know, illegal behaviour. It's, except, it, when, except when in the case of Alan Tudge, they're the ones who are behaving illegally and then they get to keep their jobs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so last call for questions. I'm sure if you think of any afterwards, Michael will be happy to receive them by email. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Okay. Well, thank you everybody again for coming along. Um, it's been another stimulating um, discussion. I have to say that I've been really impressed that since we've been doing these seminars online, we've actually had a larger turn up than we had did in the days when we were doing it face to face. So we might want to think about how once we return to some sort of post COVID normal, whether these kind of interactions are actually more efficient and, and um, are easier for people to participate in than actually getting together in the same room. So thanks again, Michael. Um, the October seminar is being delivered by Craig Applegate. And again, I'm really impressed that we have a full program for the whole year this year. Um, Ben's just popped his hand up. Or was that right. up before? No, I hope to lower it. <laughs> Okay. All right then. Well, thanks again, everyone, for coming along. Thank you, Michael, for the presentation. And um, we'll see you at the next event. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, I really appreciate it. Cheers.